Well, we are continuing in our series this morning called The Unread Books of the Bible. And what we want to do in this series is to give you an, an overview of some of the most unread books in our Bible, maybe some of the books that we've never read before or we didn't even know were even there in our Bibles. You know, I remember being at a workshop, and this was several years ago, and the speaker, he told the group, okay, um, open up in your Bibles to Hezekiah chapter 1, and I'll be speaking from there. And so he waited, and a lot of the people, they opened up their Bibles, and they were looking through, flipping through, looking for the book, looking at the table of contents, and then he finally said, hey guys, there's no such thing as Hezekiah. There's no such book in your Bibles. And so I thought, oh, that's a mean trick. That's a mean trick that you just played. But he made the point and was making the point that there are likely some books in the Bible that we've never read. And there are likely some books in the Bible that we had no idea were in our Bibles. This morning, we're going to take a look at one of the minor prophets. There are actually 12 minor prophets in our Bibles and five major prophets. The 12 minor prophets are called minor, not because they are less important or they're written by less spiritual people, but they are minor only in the fact that they are shorter, shorter in length as compared to the five major prophets. Um, for many of us, these minor prophets are some of the most unread books in our Bibles. You know, we turn into that section through our Bibles. Maybe um, the pages are a little bit more white or a little bit more crisp because we haven't really gone through it. Malachi is the last of the minor prophets in the Bible. In it, we find the people of Israel, they're coming from this, this time of really high hopes and optimism, kind of going into this season, this funk, this funk of, um, of being discouraged, of um, pessimism, and also falling into sin. This prophecy of Malachi, it came about 100 years after the people of Israel had been released from their Babylonian captivity they had since built the temple. They built a wall around their city. And they were there waiting. They are waiting for the restoration of their nation. But, you know, they found little fulfillment in, in restoration. They, they found little fulfillment in their hopes of prominence, um, of national power. And they still remained, after 100 years, a very insignificant people. So Malachi, this prophet, he came... At a, time, at a time when the people were very down and where they were, they were also struggling to believe that God was still there. They were struggling to believe that God actually, actually still loved them. And the people we see, they were focused so much on their circumstances. They were focused so much on what they were going through, feeling sorry for themselves, that beca they, they became more and more blinded to their sin. So God, he, he needs to come onto the scene and through the prophet Malachi, he needs to kind of wake the people up and say, hey, I need to talk to you guys. So he spoke, he spoke these words through the prophet Malachi. And perhaps the reason that they were feeling distant or perhaps the reason that they were struggling to even believe that God was there and that God loved them, it was because of their own waywardness is because of their own sin, and sin has a way of doing this. The world and its temptations, its pleasures, has a way of clouding our vision and taking our eyes off the Lord. So from this book, we see that it's not God that was distant. It wasn't God that was far off. God was always there. God was always there with his people, but it was the people who were distant, and it was the people who were wayward. So do you ever feel distant from the Lord? Do you ever feel perhaps like the people in Malachi's time, like, God, where are you? Where are you in all this? Do you even love us? And we should know that God is here telling the people in Malachi, and perhaps he's telling us that, hey, take a look at your own hearts. See maybe that you've lost some focus. Perhaps there's areas where you need to reprioritize your life and maybe discover that it's really your own waywardness or your own sin that is keeping you from knowing the presence of the Lord, of knowing Him in a very real and a deep, in a very deep way. Malachi, he asked these six questions of the people. And in these six questions, God is giving the nation, Israel, He's also giving us 
some pretty clear heart checks, reminding us, reminding the people of his desires for their lives, what he wants of them. And this morning, I want to go through these main themes, the main themes of these questions. Most scholars believe that this book, Malachi, is written in a chiastic structure. The middle sections versus, I mean, chapters two and three, there's four chapters total. So the middle section versus two, chapters two and three, are questions dealing with Israel's relationships with each other. As you kind of go further out in the beginning of chapter two and kind of the the latter half of chapter one, and also in chapter three, it's dealing with their service and their worship of the Lord. And then beginning and end in chapters one and chapters four, he's talking about God's character and his love and that he's perfectly loving and merciful. So I'm going to start with the middle. The middle question is going to work our way out this morning. So what is God's desire for us? What does God want to see in our lives? So important that he would send Malachi to speak these words, to warn these people, and to call these people to repentance. What does God desire for us? And the first thing that he wants of us is that he desires a wholehearted love for others. A wholehearted love for others. His people are to faithfully love each other just as he has called them to do, to love one another. And in other words... God really doesn't like it when we treat others poorly. He really doesn't like it when others are treated poorly. You know, a few weeks ago, I was picking up some donuts on a Sunday morning. Um, Sometimes I go and pick up donuts for the guys who come and set up early in the morning. And on this particular Sunday, there was this customer right right in front of me. And and this customer, he, he was... He was, he was just being a jerk, um, very condescending. He was complaining. He was talking down on this donut shop owner. And I was just standing there. I was the next person in line. I was thinking, gosh, this guy, this guy is such a jerk. You know, and I was, I was angry. I was fuming inside. And so you know what I did? I, I like, um, behind my mask, I gave him a really mean face. Can you see it? That mean face. And I showed him. I showed him how I felt, you know, but just talking to the owner after and just hearing of his own frustrations of of customers and just seeing the ugliness of treating others poorly. You know, God desires us. He wants us to have a heart to love others and to treat others well. Look at look at chapter two, verse 10. He says this, Malachi says this, he says, Are we not all children of the same father? Are we not all created by the same God? Then why do we betray each other, violating the covenant of our ancestors? Judah has been unfaithful, and a detestable thing has been done in Israel and Jerusalem. So here we see this theme of wholehearted and faithful love for one another. The, the way Judah or the way the people of Israel have been treating each other, it says that it's, been, it, it's a detestable thing, that they've been breaking their covenant with each other. They've been betraying each other. So Malachi, he gives a few examples of this, of this theme of, of wholehearted love. A few examples. One is in the context of marriage and divorce. And the other example is in the way that we treat each other and in the context of justice, of treating those who are in need. They weren't honoring God's instruction for marriage. And they were divorcing their spouses for foreign women. A detestable thing in the eyes of the Lord and an example of treating each other poorly. I do want to make a note of this. won't spend a lot of time here is that one, is that God calls us to marry believers. He calls believers to marry believers, and he also calls us to remain faithful to our spouses. You know, there are very specific situations in the Bible where where it speaks of divorce being allowable, but it is never a requirement. The people were divorcing simply because they felt like it. So they were not only breaking their covenant with each other, but they were breaking the covenant that they made before God. So so God is calling them here to be faithful 
and into a wholehearted love specifically to their spouses. And also the other example of this wholehearted love is, is, is in this area of justice to those in need, to those who can't stand up for themselves. Take a look at, at chapter 2, starting in verse 17. It says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in, this, in the Lord's sight, and he is pleased with them. You have wearied him by asking, where is the God of justice? So Israel has wearied the Lord by questioning, questioning his justice. All who do evil are good. Evil people seem to prosper. They actually seem to be favored by God. So this is wearying the Lord in verse 3, in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, look, I'm sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord who you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. So he's talking here about judgment. And he's talking about the seriousness of sin, a warning, a warning and a call to repent. Not only for the people of Israel, but showing us the seriousness of sin. So reading on, he says in verse 5, At that time, I will put you on trial. I'm eager to witness against all sorcerers and adulterers and liars. I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages, who oppress widows and orphans, or who deprive the foreigners living among you of justice. For these people do not fear me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So the people were questioning God's justice. And and they were saying that evil seemed to prosper, that the non-believers were successful. And while they were complaining, while they complained about their hardships, they were at the same time, they were neglecting God's command to love others. God's saying, don't don't point your finger at me saying, where is my justice? He says, take a look at your own heart. Take a look at your life. And God is saying to them that they are neglecting the very people that God has called them to love and to stand up for. In verse 5, it says, those cheated on wages, the widows and orphans the foreigners. So just a few questions as as Malachi is giving the people of Israel some heart check questions. Some heart check questions for us as it applies to our passage. First of all, first, are you being faithful and are you loving your spouse? Are you loving your spouse as a gift that he or she is? Are you being faithful to the covenant, the promise that you made with your spouse? Not only to your spouse, but the covenant that you made before the Lord. And kind of zooming out a little bit in this application, are you loving and are you being faithful to to your family? Are you loving them well? Are you treating them well? Are you... Are you faithful and loyal? Are you, do they get quality time and attention from you? Are you honoring each other? The people of Israel, they strayed from this. And, and, and they needed correcting in this area of, of marriage and, and just family. What about your love for others? Especially those in need. This is a calling and a command from the Lord. But how often is it overlooked? and neglected in our lives. Sometimes we focus so much on our own selves, not seeing what's going on around us. You know, I was at a workshop this past week, and at at the workshop, the speaker, um, he shared some very um, staggering and very sobering statistics. And and this is, these are statistics just in LA County alone, that there are some 33,000 orphans in LA County alone waiting for adoption. That there is 1.6 million people living in poverty. That there are 66,000 homeless. 
that there's an estimated 5,000 that are enslaved in sex trafficking. And about 439,000 kids are going to go to sleep hungry. So in this workshop, the speaker was just sharing, as he's sharing these statistics, sharing like, you know, we're not going to solve these issues overnight. But we start with one step toward restoration. And it starts in our own hearts. In our own awareness of what's going on around us. We start by praying for our hearts that we would see people as Jesus sees them. That we would be aware of what's going on around us, not so focused on our own lives and and our own needs and our own selves, and that we would take steps toward the needs of others. So one reason perhaps why the people of Israel were struggling to believe that God was there and that God really loved them was was the fact that they were only focused on themselves and that they were neglecting to love those in their families. They were neglecting to love those in their communities. And we see that this is God's heart. This is God's heart and it's also God's warning to his church. The second thing that God desires of us is he desires a sacrificial heart to serve. He desires a sacrificial heart to serve. The second theme in Malachi that will highlight is this heart to serve without expecting anything in return. So take a look at chapter 3, verse 13. It says, You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, What do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, What's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From from now on, we will call the arrogant blessed. For those who do evil get rich. Those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. So can you see what's going on here? The people were serving. They were serving, but they weren't receiving. They weren't getting anything in return. And they say, what have we gained by obeying his commands? And all the while they are serving, the people around them appear to be successful. They appear to be blessed, living the good life. You know, I've shared before that um, recently been been trying to go on jogs with my family and, and trying to trying to be healthy, trying to lose some pounds. And there was a span when we were going pretty consistently um, for a few months. But every time I would step on the scale, I know, I know we do this. We step on that scale and, okay, we read it. And then a week goes by, it's the same. And then a week, another week goes by and it's the same. And after a while, I'm thinking, what's the use? What's the use of jogging? What's the use of putting my body through this? Forget it. Forget all this jogging stuff. I'm not getting anything out of this. And, and I know it's a bad attitude. It's a bad attitude. I'm just kind of being real. But to make it even more painful, there's people who are doing the same thing that are making a point to, to go out and exercise and that they are seeing results. And it probably doesn't help, though, that um, those Sunday morning donuts. But the point is this. It's sometimes we work hard at doing something, but we don't seem to get anything in return. We work hard at doing something, but there's no results. There's nothing to gain. And I wonder if this mentality comes in when we think about serving, about serving the Lord. What am I going to get out of this? What is your motivation? What is your reason for serving? Maybe to ask it differently, what, what is your reason for not serving? What are the excuses that you maybe have for not serving? Could it be, could it be that you don't think it's worth your time? Or maybe you don't think it's worth your effort. I mean, it's kind of hard to wake up um, on Sunday mornings or it's a little draining to attend a Zoom meeting. I'm not getting anything out of it. God places a 
a huge value in serving. And he wants his people to have a sacrificial heart to serve him. So if you are, if you are maybe thinking about an area to serve or how you can serve, then please don't hesitate in asking um, one of us just in an area where, where we could plug you in so that you could experience and know the joy of serving God and that you could also know that this is his desire for you. So the last desire of the Lord that we'll talk about is this. God desires wholehearted and reverent worship. Wholehearted and reverent worship, and he rebukes worship that has become routine, or worship that is irreverent. Malachi, he begins this book very early in his book in verse 6 of chapter 1. He says this, a son honors a father and a servant his master. So pretty obvious. Son honors his father, yes. A servant honors his master, yes. The honor means to give the proper respect, to give the proper weight to another person. So reading on in verse 6, it says this, I am a father, where is my honor? I am a master, where is my fear? So pretty straightforward words coming to the nation of Israel. The people of Israel were not honoring or fearing the Lord. God's asking, where is it? Where is my honor? Where is my fear? They weren't honoring or fearing the Lord, and it showed in what they were offering to him. Look at verse 6. O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? The answer is this, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. So wholehearted worship Worship that honors him, worship that fears him. It involves offering him our very best. The priests were offering, offering to the Lord their seconds. He, they were offering their polluted and blemished animals. And so here's the truth. Here's the truth. You know how someone feels about you by the gifts that they give. Right? You know how someone feels about you by the gifts that they give. Yeah, I had a friend um, back in college, um, and he was really interested in this one girl, really interested in her, and Christmas time was rolling around, so he's thinking, what can I get for her that will really kind of communicate just how I feel, you know, that, we're, that will kind of show her that she is special. So he thought long and hard about it. We had conversations about this, about getting a gift that would be special, also something that would be sentimental. So, you know, I forgot exactly what he gave her. I think it was like a really nice stuffed animal. And I think some, some, um, something for her dog kind of show that he's thoughtful. And the day came for them to exchange the gifts. And so he gave her this nicely wrapped present and gave it to her. And then so she says, oh, I have something for you too. And she, he gave, she gave him this little envelope. Oh, he was thinking, I wonder what it is. And he opened it. And it ended up being one of those coupons for a cheeseburger at In-N-Out. And so immediately he knew how she felt about him. You know how someone feels about you by the gifts that they give. And I'm not saying that In-N-Out gift cards are, are bad. But in this context, he knew immediately how she felt about him. And the people were giving polluted and second-rate animals as a sacrifice to the Lord. You know, they are supposed to bring sacrifices that were spotless, that were healthy, that were without blemish, but they were bringing defiled food, crippled and blind animals. They are bringing their seconds. And God knew how they felt about him by what they were giving to him. They weren't giving him their very best. They're giving him their, their leftovers. So what are you bringing to the Lord? 
What are you offering to the Lord? Now remember, worship isn't just a time on Sunday mornings where we sing. Worship involves our entire lives. Our entire lives of bowing before Him and humbly serving Him as our Master in all things. What are you offering to the Lord in your life of worship? We know that God deserves our very best. What do you give of your time? What are you offering to him in your pursuits, your energy, even your finances? Do you offer him your very best? Or like the people in Malachi's time, are you offering him something that's your seconds or something that's left over? And does God get the leftover time in your lives? We all have busy schedules. I get it. We have work, we have kids, we have drop-offs, we have activities, sports. Does he get the leftover or worn out time in your schedule? Or maybe do we plan activities first and then wonder if church or serving or loving others will kind of fit into that? What about your energy? Does God get the leftover energy in your lives? Maybe for some, we need to meet him first thing in the morning where we're awake. What about finances? Does God get the leftovers of your finances? Does he get the seconds? Or does he get the first fruits? Is God and his mission, is it given priority? In your finances, does he get the very best? You know, this is a very clear theme in Malachi on this theme of giving. As we serve, as we serve others, as we serve our families, as we serve in the church, does he get our very best? As we sit and worship corporately together, does he get our very best? You know, God, he doesn't want our leftovers. The people of Israel, they thought that God was okay with their leftovers, thinking at least we gave something. But it was an insult to God, and he let them know that he was in no way honored by it. The Lord is worthy of our very best, and we should give him nothing less. So, church, let's be a people who do that. Let's be a people who offer him and give him our very best in every facet of our lives. When we're alone, when we're with our families, when we're worshiping together at church, let's give him our very best. And we know it's not about perfection. It was, if it was about perfection, we'd all fail. But God does want us to pursue excellence. And he does want us to give him our very best. So let's come humbly before him, offering him our very best, the worship that he deserves. You know, if we just take a look at the way Malachi He begins and ends this book, this prophecy. He begins by saying, God loves you. That God loves his children. And he ends by this call to repent. And this call to believe. This this book, Malachi, it's the final book in the Old Testament. It's the final words to us. Uh, we think that after, after writing Malachi, that there's 400 years of silence between the time of Malachi and the time of the New Testament. So these are the final words in many ways to, to the people of Israel. An important message for them. Final words are, are very important. And, and the message here is to repent and believe. To repent from living a life for yourself. To repent from living a life that only serves yourself. To repent from living a life that is only loving yourself and not God, not others. To repent from offering broken or second-rate worship to the Lord repent and to turn to him. 
to turn to Jesus, to know his kindness, to know his love, to know his patience, and to believe, to believe that he is here and that he is loving you and he's never stopped loving you. So church, let's take this book to heart. Know that God loves his children and that there's a call for us to turn, to turn and to trust in him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for just this um, message in Malachi. Lord, we are um, just face to face with our own, own shortcomings and our waywardness, the way that we fall short. And Lord, we thank you for books such as this that shed light on our sin, but also doesn't leave us hopeless. But Lord, that gives us a hope in Christ, a hope of forgiveness, and just the joy of, of knowing you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would help us to love others well. Lord, I pray that you would help us to serve you sacrificially and to worship you wholeheartedly and reverently. And Lord, forgive us for not doing it. And, and Lord, forgive us for the many ways that we fall short of that. And Lord, I pray that you would grow us in these areas. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you that our sins are forgiven because of Christ. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.